I have a friend who eats no meat except, well, pork. She calls herself a porkitarian. And on that, I must agree. There is no meat more delicious than that of the pig. So today we're devoting a whole episode to it. We'll start with grilled pork tenderloin. Already great, but when you put it on top of a crisp cucumber and melon salsa and add a creamy feta dressing, oh yeah, that's good. Perfect for a hot summer night. And then on Ask Sarah. I wanted to know if you have a process kind of decide which kind of thickener, thickeners you will use for a sauce or soup. Well, there's so much to say. Grace Young is back with her walk. You're a natural born walker. Oh. <laughs> We're making Chinese barbecue pork. <gasps> yes, okay. which is fabulous by itself, but we're going to use it for fried rice today, which is out of this world. Today on Sarah's Weeknight Meals. This is the perfect summer meal on a plate. Grilled pork tenderloin on top of a salsa made of cucumber, cantaloupe, fresh herbs, red onion, and then topped off with a creamy feta dressing that's been lightened up by buttermilk. It's also very quick to make. I'm gonna reach for a machine today to make it even faster. So I'm gonna start by getting my red onions soaked because I love onions. I don't mind eating them raw, but they, ha you know, they have that oniony flavor, that bite. How you tone that down is by soaking them in ice water. Paper thin, make it small. Hmm, that's good. Maybe give them another one little chop here and there just so that you don't get big, big chunks of onion. All right, so that's gonna soak for about 20 minutes. And I'm just gonna park this over here. And now I'm gonna make this creamy dressing. We do have some cheese. This is two ounces of crumbled feta cheese. I'm gonna add a third a cup of the buttermilk, a quarter of a cup of mayonnaise, a tablespoon each of fresh lemon juice and olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. And I'm gonna puree it till it's really smooth and creamy. So this looks wonderfonderfully creamy. Let's, let's have a look. Isn't that fun? You just turn it right side around, and there it is. Oh, that looks perfect. Wow. Let me just show you on a spoon. Hang on. How creamy it is. How beautifully pureed. You see that? Isn't that lovely? There we go. But we want a few chunks of the uh, of the cheese in there too, so I'm just gonna stir the second two ounces in. Okay, so that's our dressing. You know, um, it's funny, because when I was first a chef, I did everything by hand, you know. How dare you use a machine? But now, I, I love my machines. They make life a lot easier, especially when you're trying to get dinner on the table like that. Okay, it's time for the pork tenderloin. I love pork tenderloin because it's lean, and yet, unlike its cousin, you know, or its neighbor, pork loin. They, they lie in the same place next to each other in the animal. The difference between the two is this is very tender. It's like beef tenderloin. So, and it doesn't tend to dry out as much as pork loin, which is also very lean. They're the two leanest cuts. Um, so I always reach for this over pork loin, which is bigger, got a bigger eye, but just not my favorite. So I am oiling the pork tenderloin. When you're grilling, I've learned this from my friend Elizabeth Carmel, who's been on, on this show, that you oil the item. You don't oil the grill, because everybody else tells you to oil the grill, and that's wrong. It makes the, the grill tacky and have build up and get sticky, whereas when you oil the food, as long as the grill is hot, it won't stick. Okay, we'll do the other side, and then we're gonna just take this out. There we go. And just salt and pepper. Uh, you could add more spices if you want. Now, we're gonna grill this. I've been preheating the grill, and uh, we're gonna do it on medium. And it's when you think about a pork tenderloin, even though it's round, there's like four sides, if you think of it that way. So we're gonna do about two minutes a side, so all of it gets nicely colored. And then um, we'll check its temperature. It should be at about 140. 
and then we'll let it rest so all the juices redistribute. Okay, I think we're ready to go. I'm gonna go out and put this on the grill. Okay, now while that rests, I'm gonna get my salsa together. I'm just need, I've got a little bit here. I'm gonna cut another piece. We need one and a half cups chunked cantaloupe. I'm removing the skin. You want these to be uniform chunks because we're gonna chop it quickly in this machine. Now we're using one of those seedless cucumbers. I think it's so funny they say these are seedless. Yeah, they have seeds, but they're completely edible. We want less of the cucumber, more of the melon. Okay, so melon goes in first. And then the cucumber, because it's softer, you want to put the harder fruit in first. going to pulse it a few times. All right, that might be it. Just two pulses. Nice colors, isn't it? You should smell it too. Now, this gets our, our onions, which have had their time to lose their pungency. Oh, I think that's a little more onion than I want. I mean, I give amounts. It's like anything else. You can decide how much you want of everything, but I don't think I'll put quite all these onions in there. Okay, very pretty. And now we're gonna add a little fresh lime juice. Here we have some salt, a little bit of salt. And I'm just gonna quick toss this up with my impeccably clean hands and then add our herbs. Oh, that is so pretty, isn't it? So here I have some mint. This is about three quarters of a cup of mint leaves. And if you've never used herbs in a salad, you should use them like you use lettuce. They are just delicious. Don't just use them for a garnish at the end. Now I'm gonna do something a tad lazy. I could pick off, you know, one at a time, the pieces of cilantro, but instead, I'm just gonna give this a quick haircut, which will knock off some pieces. There we go, that looks nice. All right. Okay, let's say that was about three quarters of a cup. All right, now this is the base and then I'm gonna slice my pork, and then it goes on top with our dressing. Okay, let me put this on there, and then I'm gonna get my pork. So I'll put a nice mound. And don't forget the salt, the salt is important. Okay. I'm gonna show you all, see here, I'll take my pork off. See all this juice that was left? I'm gonna add that right to our sauce. We are doing what Madeline Kamen, a great cooking teacher and chef from Boston used to say, we are marrying the meat to the sauce. Because up until now, there was no relationship. Just stir that in. There we go. So, I'm gonna just take it right from the middle. Nicely, see the nice little pink glow there. You could, I mean, depending on how large your pork tenderloin is, you can get three to four portions out of one because it's a pound. And the idea being is to keep it to about four ounces per person. Okay, and then we're just gonna drizzle our sauce on top. See how creamy that is? So there you have it, my grilled pork tenderloin on a cucumber and cantaloupe salsa with a creamy feta dressing. Perfect for a hot summer night. I love doing this segment called Ask Sarah because in order to be prepared for my guests and their questions, I have to do a ton of research. So I learned something too. Today we have a special guest, Elizabeth Gears, calling from Coatesville, Pennsylvania. How can we help you today? 
I um, wanted to know if you have a process, kind of decide which kind of thickener, thickeners you will use for a sauce or soup. Well, there's so much to say. So let's get started with the obvious, which is flour. And I'm gonna show you a slurry. I've got a cup of chicken stock in here, and I've got three tablespoons of cold water, and I'm gonna add two tablespoons of the instantized flour. And this will produce a medium thickened sauce. Is it always cold? Always liquid? cold, it should be cold. You should never add your starch straight in. Dry starch to hot liquid is a disaster. You need to dissolve it first in a cold liquid. Very good question. And here goes, steady stream whisking. So after flour, we have cornstarch. It's great to thicken a cheese sauce or a cream sauce of some kind. The downsize is that if you whisk it too much, it breaks down. It's like you never thickened it. And also you cannot freeze cornstarch. Okay, moving on next to arrowroot. Have you ever heard of it before, Elizabeth? Yeah, I've heard of arrowroot. It's not so readily available, no. so I'm really, really interested to hear this. Arrowroot produces a quite clear sauce. It's tasteless, so that's a real plus. It's very good with acidic items, acidic sauces, or this is a jam here. You can use it for jams. The downside is that it's not good with dairy or cream sauces, and that if you heat it for too long, it will break down. Okay, and last but not least, we have potato starch. Now, potato starch we all associate with gluten-free cooking, baking mainly. And it wouldn't be my first choice as a thickener, but it works perfectly well. So if it's your only option, use it. It's got the most potency of all of them. You don't need as much potato starch as the others to thicken one cup of liquid. The downside is that it gets sort of gummy after it's sat around. It also will break down if you heat it too high. But there's another option which is vegetables. I've got here a vegetable soup, and you can see that the liquid is quite thin. Take this very lethal tool. Do you have one of these? Yes, a hand mixer, yes. So this is an immersion blender. I don't want to puree the whole soup. I just want to puree a little bit, and we're just going to whiz some of this. Now you can see we've got a much thicker texture is just all oh, right more hearty so exactly hearty okay well listen. i'm gonna try that good thank you so much i love that question it's one of my favorites and it's been a pleasure oh. talking to you thank you you too sarah and you too can join me like elizabeth if you send in a question to the website for ask sarah please do it Your walk is talking to you. Walk guru Grace Young is one of my favorite guests. Ooh, I'm oh, I'm smelling it. Isn't I, that this fabulous? is so wonderful. But recently, she took on a new role as an advocate for America's dying Chinatowns. Chinatown is on life support, and it's quickly slipping away. Battered by the pandemic, legacy businesses face an uncertain recovery. Oh, a lot of people with no choice but to close up. Keeping businesses like this open is Grace Young's mission. They are our link to our past. And when we lose our past, we lose a part of ourselves. I'm so thrilled to have Grace here today. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also known as the stir fry guru. Exactly. And you may or may not be the award-winning author of three cookbooks, fabulous cookbooks. So I'm so pleased that here we are again, a good buddy from way back. We go way back when we were just 12. What are we making today? We're making Chinese barbecued pork. <gasps> yes, okay. which is fabulous by itself, but we're going to use it for fried rice today, which is out of this world. Oh, I'm so excited. All righty, so we're going to start with the marinade? Yeah. Tell me what to do. Uh, we want two tablespoons of sugar, okay. bean sauce, okay. and you want just a tablespoon of it. And what is bean sauce exactly? Bean sauce is made with soybeans. It's sort of like Chinese miso. Ooh. Yeah, dark soy sauce. It's aged a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. This is hoisin sauce. This has more sugar in it. I was gonna say, this is pretty sweet. But a little bit of smokiness too. And this is the regular soy sauce. Yes. And this is all a tablespoon of each one of these, right? Right. Rice wine, Shaoxing rice wine. 
but don't worry if you can't find it. You could just use dry sherry. One teaspoon of Asian sesame oil. Right. Yep. And lastly, a little bit of white pepper. Just a pinch? Yeah, an uh, eighth of a teaspoon. Yeah. Okay, this is exactly an eighth of a teaspoon. Okay, so the pork goes right in here. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yep. And what kind of pork was it? Oh, this is one pound of pork shoulder or Boston butt. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to uh, cover it and put it in the refrigerator. For how long? Well, ideally overnight, mm -hmm. turning it occasionally. But if you're in a rush, four or five hours is great. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I think you need to hose down, <laughs> and I'll get this in here. Okay, so this we've marinated overnight, and it, it looks different. It looks like it's been marinated. Yep, it's very, very simple. All you need to do now is transfer it to this roasting pan that has the rack. So the most important thing is you want to leave about one inch of space between the pieces. This is the critical part. You add about a quarter of an inch of water, and this is what keeps the meat moist as it's cooking. So it's sort of a steamy environment. Right. Now, what is this for? So this is honey. That's local honey, by local the way. Local honey, yeah, the Came best. Came from right near here. And we're just going to drizzle a little of the honey on each piece. Wow. And that's what gives it that wonderful glaze. That's sort of like a, a roast ham. Oh, so yeah. you get this beautiful sticky glaze at the end. So this goes under the broiler? Let's, yes. Let's go pop yeah. it in. So you want it four inches from the heat. Okay. And how long do you let it go? Seven to ten minutes. Okay. Okay. Right. Wonderful. Perfect. Say you don't want to make it. Can you buy it? So. There are a lot of Chinese restaurants in Chinatown where you see roast ducks hanging in the window. Yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of restaurant where you would typically find Chinese barbecued pork. And um, it's, of course it's excellent from a restaurant, but the homemade is incredible. It is the best. So many of my students call this meat candy. Wow. Ooh, this is looking great. Yes. Wow, that's beautiful. Whoa. Yep. So I'm just turning them over. Oh my God, and that aroma. Now I'm just gonna brush on a little bit more marinade. Just a little bit. Just a little and bit. And because, because this is going back under the broiler, it doesn't matter that the raw meat marinated in this because this is gonna cook under the broiler. Exactly. Now this goes back under, what, for another, say? Seven to 10 minutes. And cover it with foil if it starts to burn. Exactly, yep. So while that's finishing up, tell me about the work you've been doing in Chinatown. Well, during the pandemic, I realized that um, I had taken Chinatown for granted, and it was really on the brink of collapse, and it still is. I mean, just because nobody's going. Exactly. I've been trying to do everything in my power to raise awareness that we need to support these historic immigrant communities. Right, because they've been around for years and years and right. years, and we depend on them. I do too. They are a sacred part of America. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Should we take a little yeah, peek? I think you're right. Oh, it's perfect. Oh my God. And the aroma. Here's our meat candy, Chinese barbecued pork. Now, how do we know it's done besides the fact that it looks perfect? So I use a meat thermometer. Oh, of course. Of course. What temp are we looking for? 155. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Now what happens with this? So we're gonna let it rest 10 minutes okay, and then cut it into one half inch dice pieces. Well, so let's go down and talk about fried rice. Absolutely. Mm. If you could start cutting, uh, chopping the skin. How many do you need? Um, roughly like a half a cup or so. Okay. So this rice has been cooked the day before, and I'm just gonna fluff it again. If you did freshly cooked rice, it's too hot and moist. Really? Yeah, and so fried rice becomes sticky and gummy. You know, I, I realized that you could also use the leftover Chinese rice, right? Yeah, if you're in a pinch and you had some Chinese takeout, you can certainly use 
uh, takeout rice. This is a peeled and deveined shrimp and it's been patted dry. This is very important. You don't want it to be sopping wet because when you put it into the hot wok with the oil, it's going to spatter and it's also going to take down the temperature of the wok. Oh, that makes sense. And I'm going to cut this into half inch pieces. And whenever you're prepping ingredients for a stir fry, it's very important to try and cut your ingredients into more or less the same size. Yeah, that makes sense. You want these padded dry also, right? Yes. And the reason for having them all the same size is because you want them all cooked at the same moment. Yeah. Now, do you want me to do the pork? Yes. The pork should be in half inch dice. So let me talk to you about my walk a little bit. I know you're very attached to your walk. You just about sleep with it, don't you? <laughs> How does your husband feel about that? I know. This is a flat bottom carbon steel walk. It's the walk that I recommend in general for most cooks. It works great on gas, electric. So it's really important to preheat the wok because mm -hmm. without that, uh, your food is going to stick when you do a stir fry. I got it. Yeah. And the other thing that we want to do is line up the ingredients in the order that we're going to use them. So here's a tablespoon of oil in the shrimp, another tablespoon of oil. Can you grab the peas? Oh, yes. So we're just using frozen peas about well, how much? Uh, one cup. I already measured it. I test the temperature of the wok with a drop of water. So this is about it. Okay. So swirl around. Yep. That's it. How, how am I doing, boss? Beautiful. Yep. And then immediately add the shrimp. Okay. Anywhere in particular? Nowhere. Okay. Just yep. in there. Yep. Okay. And then you can stir fry. Okay. So and you want to stir moving. fry this? Yeah. For about just until the shrimp turns orange. Okay, so I should be sort of just keeping it moving. Is there a particular motion? You're probably going nuts watching me. No, you're excellent. You're a natural born walker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. So it's just turned orange, and so I am going to add the next tablespoon of oil. Okay. And What's next? The rice. How do you All add it? it? All of it, just any, any particular way. That's it. Oh, that was very unceremonious. <laughs> that was a very much of a right, and right the in there. Peas. I can take the peas. Okay. Now. And again, anywhere in particular? No. Yep. Okay. The thing about Chinese cooking, it makes me so nervous. It's like doing watercolors. You spend hours getting all the materials ready, and then 30 seconds you have to get it cooked. You have to get it painted. Listen to our pan. The wok is always talking to you. Do you hear the sizzle? I do. So if we hadn't preheated correctly, there would be no sizzle sound, and that is not good. And also take a look at the fact there is absolutely no sticking. So this is natural nonstick cookware. So now we can add the pork and the scallions. Yeah, just pour it all in. Oh, that looks so good. Doesn't it? And now a half a teaspoon of salt, roughly, and about a big pinch of white pepper. Why white pepper? I know this is common in Chinese cooking. The Chinese don't like black specks. So in less than five minutes, you've got your meal. Yeah, there you go. Again, like watercolors. You're like, get right? it done, and then oh, it's, it's done. it's so beautiful. But yours is beautiful. My yeah. watercolors aren't necessary. And... The best thing is, I always have cooked rice at home, and I suddenly realize I need to get dinner on the table, and I always have something in the fridge. This is a perfect vehicle for leftovers. Yes. Fried rice. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. if this is it, we're going to go outside in my beautiful garden and have lunch. Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay. Oh, I'm so excited. Wow. Oh, I love this. It's my all-time favorite fried rice. Mm. Mm. So in the pork, and it's nice and moist, even though, you know, we cooked it medium well, because it's got all that fat in there, it keeps it going. All my friends who have made this recipe, all my students who have made this recipe, once you've made it, you can't stop thinking about it. You become an addict for Chinese, homemade Chinese barbecued mm. pork. Mm. This is just so ridiculously good. I'm going to have to make this meat candy. Um, when I told my son we were going to do this, he's like, Mom, can I come? Well, now I'm going to do it. And now I see how easy it is. I have to say thank you so much. And thank you for coming back. 
Let's have a little toast. Sarah, it's been my pleasure, and I'm glad you're a new addict. <laughs> oh my God, yes. Thank you. Next time, we'll go to Chinatown. Absolutely, yes.